Xavier Brunson for promotion to general and to be commander of U.S. Forces Career, United Nations Command, and the Republic of Korea, United States Combined Forces Command. General Reed, congratulations on your nomination. I would like to welcome your wife, Lynn, and son, Alexander. General Brunson, I understand that military service runs deep in your family, so I'd like to first welcome your wife, retired Colonel Kirsten Brunson, Colonel, son, Josh, father, retired Command Sergeant Major Albert Brunson, mother, Delphine, brother, Colonel La Havi Brunson, and sister-in-law, Karen, and also brother, Colonel Tavy Brunson, United States Army. Oh. Uh, That's impressive. Uh, that's a remarkable dedication to the country uh, and the U.S. Army by your family. Thank you. Uh, I also am delighted to welcome Congressman Marilyn Strickland from the great state of Washington who will introduce General Brunson. The committee is grateful to both of your families for their support and service. Let me also recognize the outgoing leaders at Transportation Command, or TRANSCOM, and U.S. Forces Command, Korea. General Jacqueline Van Ovost has led TRANSCOM admirably through a historic set of challenges, particularly in coordinating the international logistics campaign to support Ukraine and Israel. I congratulate her on her well-deserved retirement after 36 years of service in the United States Air Force. Similarly, General Paul LaCamera has led U.S. Forces career with distinction, playing a key role in forging the new security pacts between the United States, South Korea, and Japan. The committee is grateful for his nearly four decades of service in the Army and congratulates him on his retirement. General Reed, you currently serve as Deputy Commander of the Air Mobility Command, the largest component of TRANSCOM. You are a C-141 pilot by training and have served in multiple transport and tanker units throughout your career. These experiences will serve you well as TRANSCOM commander. The men and women of TRANSCOM perform missions that sustain the entire Department of Defense. We have seen this clearly through the command's role in providing support to Ukraine and our operations in the Middle East. American troops continue to operate logistic lines and forward operating centers to receive and transport enormous amounts of security aid from across the international community. TRANSCOM's ability to conduct support operations around the globe remains a clear competitive advantage for the United States. However, the command faces a number of challenging tasks. Keeping an eye to the future and the pacing threat of China, we know that any potential adversary would attack our logistic network. Uh, this idea of congested logistics will include obvious threats to our forward bases, as well as the aircraft and ships that supply those bases but it could also include cyber attacks against the information technology system, government and commercial, and possible kinetic attacks against the ports and airfields that support our deployments. There is also the issue of Chinese investments in critical infrastructure like seaports and telecommunications, which may seem like standard commercial enterprises, but which could be leveraged to disrupt or deny access in a time of crisis. General. Given your experience with Air Mobility Command, I believe that these are not new issues for you. I would like to know how you would prepare TRANSCOM for such threats to our logistics and how the military services can alter their acquisition programs to take these concerns into account. General Brunson, you are extremely well qualified to serve as Commander of U.S. Forces Career. You currently serve as the Commanding General of I Corps and have served previously in top leadership positions with the 7th Infantry Division, the 10th Mountain Division, the 18th Airborne Corps, Corps, and especially the 1st Battalion, 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which you led into combat. If confirmed, you will face a challenging mission on the Korean Peninsula. Earlier this month, I traveled to a number of sites in the Indo-Pacific, including South Korea, Guam, and the Philippines, to assess our military and diplomatic postures there. The threats from China and North Korea are significant, but I was impressed with our capabilities and remain optimistic about the progress we are making. For our long-term success against China, it is fundamentally tied to the strength of our alliance with South Korea. The recent growth of this relationship, as well as South Korea's remarkable new partnership with Japan, can serve as a model for other relationships in the region. We should redouble our efforts to build multilateral networks, including 
with the Philippines, the ASEAN countries, and the Pacific Islands into security cooperation efforts. General Brunson, I would ask for your views on the partnership between the United States, Japan, South Korea, and other regional partners in addressing China and North Korea's destabilizing activities. The threat from North Korea is real and is growing. To meet it, the United States must continue to invest in the fight tonight mentality alongside our South Korean allies. Indeed, North Korea's relationship with Russia continues to strengthen and Kim Jong-un is likely receiving technical assistance and lessons learned from Putin's invasion of Ukraine, particularly for North Korea's missile and nuclear capabilities. General, I would appreciate your view on the current threat from North Korea and how your forces are maintaining readiness through training and exercises with their South Korean counterparts. I saw some of these efforts first here and during my visit as the combined combined was wrapping up the Daniel Ulchi Freedom Shield exercise. Gentlemen, if confirmed, you will lead Transcom and U.S. Forces career at a consequential time. We thank you again for your continued willingness to serve. I look forward to your testimonies. Now, let me recognize the ranking member, Senator Roger Wicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the committee is considering nominees for two crucial commands. Lieutenant General Reed, you've been nominated to be commander, United States Transportation Command. If confirmed, you'll be responsible for executing Transcom's mission of providing logistical support to combatant commanders around the globe. In your current role as Deputy Commander of Air Mobility Command, you have seen firsthand how logistics are often the determining factor in a fight. We once considered logistics to be a minor factor in opera operational planning, but now we know better. We understand that logistics are essential to our ability to deter and defeat our adversaries. There is one way to ensure that those logistics capabilities are ready when needed, and that is by properly resourcing the department. We need our senior military leaders to tell us the hard truths about what they need, even when doing so contradicts the president's budget. And you and I spoke about this when we met um, person to person. That transparency is so important that we made the unfunded priority lists a statutory obligation. This will be your statutory obligation. I'm very troubled, as I told you, that Transcom has not requested a single unfunded requirement for the last three fiscal years. Lieutenant General Reed, if confirmed, I would look to you to begin performing that task. We're not asking you to make anything up. Uh, we're just asking you to tell us what we need on, congest on contested logistics, particularly in the Western Pacific. We need you to tell us what you need to get up to speed. Now, Lieutenant General Brunson, you've been nominated to be commander of U.S. Forces Korea. Um, my uncle served in Korea. Two generations later, my son, has served in Korea. Our alliance with the Republic of Korea dates back to the early days of the Cold War and the Korean War, when the communist threat from the Soviet bloc and China turned into a hot war on the Korean Peninsula. Our bond with the Republic of Korea remains even as the threat environment changes. The danger from North Korea continues to increase with each passing day. Kim Jong-un has been developing and building more nuclear weapons, cruise missiles, and other capabilities, all of which pose an increasing threat to the United States and our allies. Moreover, we've seen troubling evidence that North Korean-made weapons have been used against innocent Ukrainians and Israelis. To ensure that we maintain stability on the peninsula, we need to start thinking about what capabilities the United States and South Korea need we should also explore ways to reduce Kim Jong-un's ability to arm the axis of aggressors. General Brunson, I look forward to hearing your thoughts about these troubling trends and how we can mitigate them. Particularly, um, I look forward to hearing you discuss uh, an issue that the chair raised a few moments ago about what lessons um, both our friends and our adversaries in the region are learning from what's going on in Ukraine. So to our nominees and their distinguished families, thank you for being here today. And um, 
for their service to our country. And uh, thank you, Representative Strickland, for being here also. Thank you very much, Senator Wicker. Now I'm uh, pleased to introduce Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland, uh, Washington's 10th District. Uh, Congressman Strickland is a member of the House Armed Services Committee and represents Joint Base Lewis McCord. Uh, Congresswoman Strickland, please. Chair Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, it is my distinct honor today to introduce my friend, Lieutenant General Xavier Brunson, who has been nominated to the rank of General and Commander of U.S. Forces Korea. Lieutenant General Brunson currently serves as a Commanding General of America's First Corps at Joint Base Lewis McCord, also known as JBLM. I'm currently in my second term in Congress, representing the nearly 40,000 service members that call JBLM home. And General Brunson has been a key partner to improve the lives and livelihoods of service members and their families. General Brunson and I have worked hand in hand to increase the quantity and quality of housing at JBLM, including with the recent groundbreaking of the first of its kind barracks project. We've also worked to address childcare shortages, support military spouses in finding employment, ensuring the readiness of the soldiers and airmen at JBLM. As one of the first Korean American women elected to Congress, I can think of no one better to take command of US Forces Korea as we continue to deepen and strengthen our partnership with the Korean Armed Forces and government. I was born in Korea, my father served in the army, and my family ended up in Tacoma, Washington at Fort Lewis at the time. So I am very deeply, deeply proud to be here today. First Corps is laser focused on the Indo-Pacific, participating in exercises and activities in 21 countries, including Australia, Japan, and Korea. First Corps is a key component of the Army's and U.S. strategy to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific in coordination with our partners and allies. Prior to serving as Commanding General of First Corps, General Brunson was previously the Deputy Commanding General of I Corps, Commanding General of 7th Infantry Division at all, all JBLM. A commissioned infantry officer, General Brunson has served several deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. General Brunson, as you mentioned, comes from an Army family. He and his family serve the country every single day. His father is a retired Army Sergeant Major who served in the Vietnam War. His brothers became Army officers as well. His wife, Kirsten Brunson, is a retired Colonel. General Brunson and his family are the best of us. They are the best of America. General Brunson has been an exemplary partner to me, my staff, and the entire state of Washington and I know he will represent the United States with distinction as commander of U.S. Forces Korea. I look forward to a swift confirmation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Representative Strickland. Uh, General Reed, your opening statement, please. <clears throat> Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, thank you for the opportunity to appear before this distinguished committee and the American people. I am humbled to be the president's nominee to command United States Transportation Command and equally grateful to both the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs for their confidence and support. It is also a great opportunity to testify with my friend, Lieutenant General Xavier Brunson. I also want to thank the current commander of U.S. Transportation Command, General Jacqueline Van Ovost and her spouse, Alan Frosch for their celebrated leadership of U.S. Transcom and their friendship throughout the years. General Van Ovost has an envious relationship with this committee, and if confirmed, I will build upon that trust. My joy stems from family. Here today, providing me strength, is my bride and best friend, Lynn, who successfully balanced a professional life with maintaining as much stability as possible for our three sons. I am grateful Alexander, seated with us, was able to take a break from his passion as a flight instructor to support dad. My pride in my young men is directly related to Lynn's devotion, which extends far beyond the Reed home, as countless service members and families of every service continue to benefit from her care and advocacy. Endless devotion also describes my parents, both who are watching this morning. Thank you both for the values I've used to inspire and support so many since the 1980s. I also benefit from a tradition of military service, 
with family members surviving action in every major conflict since the Great War, raised the son of an active duty airman and Vietnam veteran, as well as growing up in a joint community just south of here in Hampton Roads. That early exposure to all military branches set an important foundation for my own military service, especially during assignments supporting multiple combatant commands with national and international consequences. Foundational assignments include a tour as a joint logistician in the Pentagon, grappling global issues, as well as a senior defense, senior defense official and defense attache appointment, resolving regional challenges at the nexus of multiple combatant commands, government agencies, allies, and partners. If confirmed, I am committed to bringing that experience and more to bear, committed to empower the men and women of US Transcom in partnership with commercial industry, allies, and partners to remain the most responsive and strategic mobility capability the world has ever seen. The responsive and strategic nature of US Transcom while vital to our national security, faces increasingly capable contests and disruptions in the air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace domains. Despite contests and disruptions from determined and sophisticated adversaries, if confirmed, I will ensure U.S. Transcom's contribution to strengthen a lethal joint force. This will include, but is not limited to, continuing pursuit of an ever-ready, modernized, sea lift, airlift, and air refueling fleet. If confirmed, I will also prioritize cyber resilience for both U.S. Transcom and other members of the Joint Deployment and Distribution Enterprise. Chairman Reed and Ranking Member Wicker, if confirmed, I cannot imagine a greater honor than to work with this committee, our like-minded allies and partners, our commercial industry professionals, our services, and our combatant commands to ensure together we deliver. Distinguished members, before we transition to questions, I would like to take this opportunity to wish my mom happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> very, very smart uh, declaration there. I, you know, you're in good shape with home. So. General Bronson, your statement, please. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to appear before you today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and more importantly, if confirmed, to continue leading our nation's men and women. I would like to thank President Biden, Secretary Austin, and General Brown for their trust and confidence. And I'm honored to testify today alongside Lieutenant General Randy Reed, the nominee for the United States Transportation Command. Transcom is a critical enabler in the Indo-Pacific ensuring our armed forces have the resources they need when they need it. I would like to thank my family for their love and support throughout my military career. My wife of 30 years, Kirsten, a retired Army Colonel, Army Judge, member of the Army Women's Hall of Fame, and tireless advocate for Army families, is the best officer in our family. She saw me in this chair long before last week's call asking me how long it would take me to get to DC. She's my confidant, my loving critic, counselor, and heart. Our family is because of her. To my children, Rachel, Rebecca, and Joshua, thank you for your continued support. Being your dad is the thing I'm most proud of. Joshy, you can tell me thank you later for pulling you out of school so that you could be here to support me today. I love you. I would like to thank my parents also with us today, retired Sergeant Major Albert Brunson and my praying mother, Delphine Brunson. They raised three sons to understand the importance of God, family, and service. My father served in the Army for 27 years, including two tours in Vietnam, and service in Operation Desert Storm. In 2018, I finally eclipsed my father's record of static line jumps. <laughs> His service inspired me and my brothers to dedicate our lives in service to our nation. I'm pleased to have in attendance today my much shorter brother, Colonel Lahavi Brunson, <laughs> 
who is currently serving on the Army staff and his wife, Karen. Equally as short as his twin, Colonel Tavi Brunson, who is also here with us today, currently serving at U.S. Army Central Command. His wife, Cynthia, had to go back to Texas to care for her sick sister, or she would be here today as well. Our family carries a legacy of over 130 years of service, and I'm proud to be a part of it. There are a host of mentors, friends, and soldiers, far too many to mention here, to whom I sincerely say thanks. Having spent the last five years focused on the Indo-Pacific, I can tell you that the environment is both complex and dynamic. I'm aware of the threat South Korea faces and fully understand my role, if confirmed, is in, is in ensuring a constant state of readiness for all forces on the peninsula. Most assuredly, I understand the need to defend the homelands. North Korea's rapid advancement of its nuclear and missile capabilities, combined with its stated ambition to exponentially expand its nuclear arsenal, is the single greatest challenge facing the tri-commands. The phrase fight tonight is not just a saying, but a reality for the men and women serving in Korea. The Korean theater of operations is a combined joint multi-domain and interagency operating environment. If confirmed, I will ensure all service members and civilians within the three commands are trained and equipped to respond in competition, crisis, or conflict. I fully endorse the four long-standing United Nations Command, Combined Forces Command, and United States Forces Korea priorities of sustaining and strengthening the alliance, maintaining the armistice, transforming the alliance, and sustaining the force. I would like to wish a happy Chuseok to Koreans around the world, and most especially to the people of the Republic of South Korea. Finally, on behalf of Kirsten and my family, I would like to recognize General Paul Camera. Having served in both war and peace at his side, I can say with confidence that he has led the tri-commands in Korea remarkably. To him and his wife, Teresa, thank you for your loyal and dedicated service to our nation. Thank you again, Chairman Reed and Ranking Member Wicker and members of this committee for this great opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Kachi Kapshida, under one flag, fight tonight. Thank you very much, General Brunson. I have a series of required questions that all nominees must answer. You may answer in unison. Have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? Yes. Have you assumed any duties or taken any actions that would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? No. no. Exercising our legislative and oversight responsibilities makes it important that this committee, its subcommittees, and other appropriate committees of Congress receive testimony, briefings, reports, records, and other information from the executive branch on a timely basis. Do you agree, if confirmed, to appear and testify before this committee when requested? Yes. yes. Do you agree, when asked before this committee, to give your personal views, even if your views differ from the administration? Yes. yes. Do you agree to provide records, documents, and electronic communications in a timely manner when requested by this committee, its subcommittees, or other appropriate committees of Congress, and to consult with the requester regarding the basis of any good faith delay or denial in providing such records? Yes. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established by this committee for the production of reports, records, and other information, including timely responding to hearing questions for the record? Yes. yes. Will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to congressional requests? Yes. yes. Will those witnesses and briefers be protected from reprisal for their testimony or briefings? Yes. Thank you very much. General Reed, uh, you have a series of issues that you'll have to confront, and uh, one of them is the cyber protection of your forces, and that in many respects is a reflection that uh, most of your reserves are civilian platforms, both merchant ships and aircraft. And uh, what do you intend to do to ensure the cyber security of these, particularly these private uh, entities that come under your command? Thank you, Chairman. Logistics uh, by nature is an information heavy activity. And uh, while we in 
uh, Transcom if confirmed and, and from an air component perspective. Uh, we plan a lot on the secret side, but when we share the information and we come together, a lot of that is not on the secret side. And so sharing that information requires that we have ways to protect the information. Uh, Transcom, I'm aware, does a lot to monitor its information networks, but at the same time, it also partners uh, very well with the commercial entities. If confirmed, uh, I'll make sure that Transcom continues its cyber surveillance and at the same time uh, offers the forum through very proactive working groups to invite the entire community to come together, share best practices, and also as we write contracts for them to support us that the baseline for that includes things that they need to do to protect their information. Well, thank you. Another aspect of uh, Transcom, as I alluded to before, is if we go uh, and fully mobilize, you'll have to call merchant ships uh, that are now in commercial service into you know, Transcom. You'll also have to call in aircraft. Is there a is there a question in your mind about the sufficiency or the capacity of the fleet we could generate in a short period of time? Senator, for the commercial partners that they have, they are avid volunteers to serve with us um, each and every day as we operate around the world in competition. Uh, they are there with us and they provide a tremendous amount of the capability of our ability to move. In the shift from day-to-day -day ops to crisis and conflict, uh, we have some emergency pr programs uh, with which they could surge. Uh, we also have in Transcom, uh, in, as I see it from the air component perspective, a mobility requirements capability study, which actually helps inform us uh, what sufficiency we need. And uh, Senator, I'm here to tell you from what I've seen, uh, it's there. Thank you. General Brunson, uh our recent trip to South Korea, I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, President Yoon, who's done an extraordinary job of pulling together with his Japanese counterpart a working relationship that had never existed before, and also reaching out to the Philippines and other nations. Um, we have also, with the declar declaration that President Biden and President Yoon announced at Camp David, uh, Going into the sharing of real-time information with the South Korean forces uh, and planning multilateral, uh, multi-year trilateral exercises. So, could you elaborate on your sense of where the relationship is going? And I, I, my sense, it was vastly improved. Uh, yes, Chairman. Uh, I believe the relationship at present is trending upward strongly. Uh, as I look in my previous experience as a Corps commander, uh, what we've been able to do in terms of going into multilateral exercises, securing uh, the information that's being shared, whether that be through technological means, using sensitive but unclassified, or using UB keys on a mission partner network or environment, what those things provide for us is, a, is an opportunity that hasn't existed before. Uh, some of the things that General LaCamera has done to drive from the military element of power have allowed us to draw closer together because we're able to share information across these multilateral exercises. And what that's really doing, Chairman, is it's helping us to set the environment. And so what I see is a, is a charge to myself, if confirmed, is to continue to find ways to bring not only uh, the northeastern piece of, the, of, the, of Asia together, but to also bring in the South, having participated in exercises from India to Indi uh, Indonesia to Australia and points beyond, that there are willing allies that are in the region at this time. Sir. Thank you very much, General Brunson. Thank you both, gentlemen. Uh, Senator Worker, please. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant General Reed. Let's talk about unfunded requirements. I promised that I would ask that. Um, for the last three years, Transcom has failed to submit a single unfunded requirement. Yet, it proceeds to submit re reports and studies outlining shortfalls within its components. So, first of all, if confirmed, will you submit any unfunded requirements for components such as Air Mobility Command or others that directly support Transcom's ground and sea lift elements? Senator, thank, thank you for the conversation. 
yesterday. And uh, as we discussed yesterday, uh, I will be a fierce advocate to get uh, all of the equipment that our folks need. And I know that there are several ways to pursue that. And uh, absolutely, Senator, if unfunded requirements is, is the way to get the, the force equipped, I will certainly do that. Okay, well, and just um, along those lines, um, it is a statutory requirement that this uh, Congress and this committee um, uh, um, expects. And so you, uh, along those lines, you agree that underfunded requirements are important in providing information to this Congress about, about what the Joint Force needs? A absolutely, sir. Okay, let me ask about, um, about movement of, um, of household goods. Um, th there's a, um, what, what do you know about the agreement between um, HomeSafe and Transcom uh, about how that's going and do you think it's gonna work better? Senator, I will tell you that uh, having moved in excess of 15 times, <laughs> uh, having a system that works is very important. And um, if confirmed in Transcom, I'll have an opportunity to uh, make sure where there's room for improvement, we will absolutely get that done. I will also tell you that there are some family members behind me on both sides who will put pressure on me to make sure that we actually get that done. Uh, what I do know of the contracts so far is that uh, it initiated this spring, about April. Uh, there uh, were some moves that were executed under the contract during the peak period this summer in some locations. Uh, from what I understand, Senator, uh, for those, uh, things have gone well. Uh, the feedback is strong, not only from the families who have moved, but also from the transportation carriers who had an opportunity to participate that, that did not before. Uh, going forward, we will have to be careful with that in terms of the speed of the transition. But uh, now that we have a single entity that sits over top of that, uh, they do have a capability to integrate a little bit better on the national scale and on the local markets as well. Uh, and so uh, as long as we're very careful in the speed of the transition center, I think this shows tremendous promise. Um, okay, and we'll, so we'll be visiting about that in the next months. Uh, speaking of family members, uh, General Reed, do you think it's fair for um, General Brunson to talk about the height of his twin brothers? <laughs> Since, uh, uh, they came in, in a package of two and he's only one. It seems to me his family got two for the price of one. I'll withdraw the question. Um, what lessons are we learning um, in, in watching the Ukrainian conflict, the Russia's war of illegal war of aggression against Ukraine? And what lessons are our um, adversaries um, north, north of the um, DMZ learning? Uh, Ranking Member Wicker, uh, I think that one of the things that we're learning is the need uh, to move beyond current means of production. For example, uh, the need for munitions and uh, lethal aid from uh, Russia outpaced their ability to produce those things. So they found a proxy to provide them uh, arms and ammunition. Uh, I think that what we also are learning from this is that one of our strengths that's playing out over a, a wide variety of engagements around the world just falling short of full-on war is that this, uh, our United States forces are part of a partnered network of friends, allies, and partners that make us strong, where we can look for capacity and capabilities amongst our partners. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is a great example of that. For 70 years, this alliance has stood, and it is an example for all other nations to look toward. When you look at uh, sort of authoritarian collusion that occurs between China and DPRK and Russia and Iran and others, uh, they don't have the same benefits that we have. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Senator Worker. I associate myself with your comments about uh, the general's brothers. They are, they are men of normal height, uh, and I applaud them. Senator Shaheen, please. Um, 
congratulations, General Reed and General Brunson, to both of you and to your families. Um, and thank you so much for the service of each of you and all of your families. And I especially appreciate your senses of humor, um, which, as you can see, is shared by the committee. Um, General Brunson, I want to pick up on Senator Wicker's questions about um, munitions and the support from North Korea to what's happening in Ukraine. Um, there's now photo evidence of that. Um, I understand there's a British report that also found Western dual-use components in the missiles that were examined. So how concerned should we be about the fact that we still have um, that sort of diversion of our Western components going into the war zone being used by our adversaries? Senator, I think we ought to be concerned. Uh, and if confirmed, it would be my hope that we would be able to take not a whole of government approach at uh, sort of tracking these things where they're going, but a multi-element engagement, which would be more targeted. So if confirmed, what I would do is I would dive into the IC to see where these components were made, where they're going to. Uh, the, the benefit that the Tri-Command has is that there's UN command that's a part of this. And a great many of these nations, uh, I would be supposing here, giving you something that I believe um, could be tied with those means of production. So I believe that it would be my job as the, uh, if confirmed as a USFK commander, to not be so concerned with what we can see, but the things that we don't see. Uh, in another setting, I would be more than happy to talk to you about some of the things that I know that General LaCamera is working on right now in that regard to help us um, to more easily be able to uh, sort of illuminate the network that exists for those parts, ma'am. And I think it's best that I stop there. Thank you. I, I would appreciate that opportunity. Um, General Reed, thank you for taking time last week to come and meet with me. One of the issues that we discussed was the Air National Guard Bureau's intent to relevel programs of record that's going to have an impact on the 157th Air Refueling Wing at Peace Air Force Base in New Peace National Guard Base in New Hampshire, former Air Force Base. Um, and we also discussed the importance of aerial refueling capacity, which you um, know so well and cite in your testimony. As the only KC-46 refueling wing in the nation to reach initial operating capacity, do you agree that the 157th plays a significant role in meeting TRANSCOM's requirements? Senator, absolutely. A uh, very fine unit um, in my commands in the past uh, across the world. Uh, they were uh, very quick to respond when called upon and love to serve with them. Um, also want to point out that uh, we're looking forward to their service this fall um, as they deploy. So uh, out of the eight airplanes that are there, uh, four will go forward and uh, they will do a fine job for us. Thank you. The proposed releveling initiative will decrease the 157th ability to support TRANSCOM by our estimation is 23%. Are you concerned about losing that kind of capacity, especially as you think about what we may need to do in the Indo-Pacific? Senator, I'll share with you that the air refueling fleet is incredibly stressed every day as they support every combatant command around the globe. Um, any capacity that we can get, I'll absolutely call for in, in need. Um, if confirmed, uh, I will uh, have conversations uh, with hopefully, if confirmed, Steve Nordhaus uh, to make sure that uh, he and the force can provide the nation everything that we're asking for. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And if confirmed, will you commit to visiting New Hampshire and to getting a briefing on what's happening with the 157th? Yes, Senator. Thank you. Um, I want to go back, um, General Brunson, to the player that we haven't really talked about so far this morning, and that is uh, the PRC and China's reaction. How, how concerned are you about the aggressive behavior of uh, the PRC in the South China Sea, and what, of, what kind of an impact does that have on your responsibilities as you um, as you would take over in Korea? <clears throat> Senator, um, I think we should uh, share the concerns of our partners in the region. 
And, and we ought to look at this much like a balloon. If you push on one area of this balloon, there's going to be an opposite reaction somewhere else. I think that if confirmed, my job is to hold the peninsula, uh, fixed but dynamic because of all the things that are going on in the region. And again, I would point back to that authoritarian collusion that we be able to understand best what is uh, troubling our friends, partners, and allies in the region. Uh, Senator, as you know, there are a host of mutual defense treaties that exist in the Pacific. Uh, and folks are counting on us to assure them of not only our presence, but our willingness to act. And I think that what I'd have to do if confirmed as a USFK commander is to be able to separate actions from actors and be able to go to the Indo-PACOM commander and talk to him about operations and uh, activities and investments that are being made in the region uh, for him to even have a conversation with the Secretary of Defense on our policy toward actions to be taken in the region. Uh, I also find myself uh, witting to the fact that, that there are things that we don't see right now. But these things have to be um, looked at from the perspective of tying in more of the IC to things that we were doing. To your earlier question, Senator, what I said was we've got to be targeted within uh, within our own elements of national power, to say it quite simply. Uh, and that targeting means that it's not enough to just say the whole of government. There are elements of power that ought to be brought into play here uh, that I think could help us deal with any of those situations, be it in the northern, northeastern corridor or through the southern corridor or even in the center. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, General Reed, General Brunson, and welcome to your families today. As the grandmother to two sets of twins, I'm on their side. <laughs> General Reed, in a potential conflict with a peer adversary, our forces will likely have to face a contested logistics environment, which implies that Transcom must account for tr attrition. This would be unlike anything we've seen since World War II. If confirmed, how would you ensure that mobility forces are appropriately training to realistic threats in these transcom exercises that are needed? Thank you, Senator. If confirmed, uh, one of the first things that I'll do is I'll get with the planning shops to take a very deep look into the plans and what we're doing to plan with the theaters uh, to see what their challenges are and what adjustments we may have to take. In addition to the planning, what's important next is to make sure that we have realistic training as well. Um, I will share with you that from an air component perspective, part of what we've been doing is participating in a series of exercises, one of them being uh, the Bamboo Eagle, uh, which takes place on the West Coast. And in this, we simulate a contested environment and we've learned uh, several things that are important. If confirmed, uh, this will be a good platform to bring to uh, not just uh, airlift and air refueling, but to sea lift as well. If confirmed, how would you increase the inner op operability with our allies and partners? Senator, uh, first and foremost, I would uh, depend uh, primarily on the theater combatant commanders who already have the relationships with them. Uh, Two, I would make sure that we are involved in their planning and then offer our forces to partner with them as well. Thank you. General Brunson, do you agree that the United States must remain unequivocal in our commitment to extended nuclear deterrence with our ally, South Korea? S Senator, I, I believe that, that uh, that one, there's policy on, on all these things, but what I do believe is that the uh, NCG has gone to great lengths to bring us closer to be able to talk about a lot of these issues. I think that uh, denuclearization of the peninsula, it, it accounts for several things. One, in terms of classic deterrence, we, we uh, have to continue to assure our partners that we are there. I think that uh, it's everything from protection to sustainment to even our posture in the region, uh, understanding the fact that there will be um, continued discussions, uh, you know, but some of those discussions are sovereign issues, ma'am. 
And, and what I think that we've got to do is to trust the established frameworks that are there, like the NCG, uh, in the, the directives that come from that as we look to assure our partners so that there not, not be further discussion about those things, ma'am. We've, we've been seeing, um, I think, a lot of destabilizing actions from North Korea. Um, recently, they released uh, images of their uranium enrichment facility. Uh, they did that last week. How, how would you go about reassuring South Korea that our nuclear umbrella uh, remains firm for them? Ma'am, sometimes um, the best way to do that is to recognize where the adversary is maneuvering at. Uh, I would, in my own military estimation, say that he was maneuvering in the information space. And so making a careful assessment so that we not have miscalculation. I think that that's where I would start at, ma'am, is to come close to our partner, our ally in Korea, and explain to them what we were seeing. Um, and then trust, again, uh, our diplomats and others to continue to have higher level discussions, but at its base, it's being able to assure our partner and ally uh, that we're there and we, they can exist under not only a conventional umbrella, but a nuclear umbrella on the peninsula. We've had a, a recently established um, group form, the Nuclear Con Consultative Group. Would you, do you see that as an avenue that you, that you might um, uh, be able to use? in providing the, the assurances that our, our allies in South Korea need? Uh, yes, ma'am, and please forgive me for using an acronym. I am an Army man, and so I kept saying NCG, NCG, because I didn't want to wrestle with consultative group. <laughs> um, but yes, ma'am, that would certainly be an avenue that, okay. that's available. And, and I think that, that when we use um, constructs like the NCG, it relieves us of this uh, almost uh, dilatorious effect of just wow. deciding that one letter <laughs> is gonna get it done by all. And uh, I am trying to caution myself on saying whole of government because it's not targeted, it's not precise, words matter. And we ought to talk about the multi-element engagement that's necessary to ameliorate a host of problems that we see, not only in the peninsula, but around the world, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to the nominees and your families. You're both very well qualified for these positions. General Reed, this is the first time we've had a hearing um, since, uh, with, with relevant folks before us since the DOD canceled the joint logistics over the shore effort to do the humanitarian pier into Gaza. And I don't really want to get into too much questioning about it, but I do want to say I hope there's gonna be an after action review of that effort, what worked, what didn't, and what can be improved. Because we're gonna to have to do joint logistics over the shore in all likelihood in the future. And everyone on this committee noticed some good, 20 million uh, pounds of aid delivered into Gaza, that was a good thing. Um, it was also good that some people served under very difficult conditions to do this work, including the 7th Transportation Brigade out of uh, Fort Langley, Eustace. But there was also real problems. There were problems with conducting the operation due to weather. There were problems with conducting the operation due to a challenging security environment. There were problems with conducting the operation because of challenges matching up with humanitarian aid groups on the shore. In my view, the biggest problem was this. This all could have been done by Israel. We've stopped the humanitarian aid pier and now humanitarian aid is going into the Ashad port in Israel and being delivered by land to Gaza as it was before October 7. The fact that the United States needed to spend $230 million, that was the estimated cost up front. I don't know what the actual price tag was and deploy people, I think about a thousand US troops were involved in this when the aid could have been delivered through an Israeli port and through land crossings that were being used extensively and now are being used to deliver aid strikes me as the U.S. wanting to do the right thing, but doing something that frankly someone else should have been doing. And so the only question I would have for you is, is there some kind of an after action study that's being done that Congress could have access to when it is done about the good, the bad, and how we need to improve going forward? 
Senator, it's my understanding that uh, there is something being studied. Uh, if confirmed, uh, obviously that will be one of the things that I will look into. Uh, joint logistics over the shore in its totality uh, is uh, something that Transcom would support in some form or another. Um, and this committee would be looking to me to make sure that we were able to actually get that done. And so, uh, yes, Senator, I will look into that and I will provide information to this. And committee. I know uh, entities other than Transcom obviously were key to this CENTCOM. It was a lot of people that weren't, a lot of parts of the DOD family that were involved. But I think we need some answers about it. And in particular, the last piece, what do we need to do to improve going forward? Um, let me ask you this. Um, the, the 2020 NDAA guaranteed there would be 60 congressionally funded operating agreements for the maritime security program. And it extended existing agreements through September 30, 2025, a year from now. All 60 agreements are currently filled. As you're already aware, the MSP provides a retainer incentive to ensure that there are vessels available in times of national need. If confirmed, how do you plan to ensure that the MSP um, is appropriately resourced to meet our strategic needs? Senator, that's an outstanding program that we have to make sure that when the nation needs to move in a decisive manner that we can ship things by sea. Um, uh, under that program uh, where we have access to commercial ships, uh, these ships register, they actually want to participate with us. Uh, if confirmed, uh, one of the things that I will do is to make sure that I strengthen the relationships that we have and that uh, we continue to inspire them to serve. Thank you. And General Brunson, on the subject of negotiating agreements, the last round of negotiations on the U.S.-Korea Special Measures Agreement were tough, and they put some strain on one of our most important relationships. The current agreement that was negotiated is due to expire next year, thus more negotiations are underway to complete that. I don't want to ask you to get into the politics of the negotiations, but can you just highlight for the committee the importance of the relationship and the need to find a path forward to uh, reach an agreement that will be good for all parties? Yes, Senator. Um, so, um, of course, uh, I'm not a negotiator. I'm not negotiating that agreement at all. Uh, the State Department is well involved in that. But what I will tell you is, as a Corps commander, the things that I have seen. Uh, I've seen uh, Camp Humphreys and the housing that's available to our families there. Uh, the, the resources that are available to those families there, uh, much of that done by the Korean government. Um, I also know, sir, for a fact, that when you look at APS4, for example, and that's maintained by Korean workers there, and it's maintained in such a high state of readiness that the soldiers I talked to, uh, I don't think we have any members from Texas here, but the soldiers I talked to from mm -hmm. Fort Bliss preferred the vehicles they used on the Idri in the most recent large scale exercise than they do those back mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And so if I give you those two data points right there, that those soldiers are absolutely fired up about the equipment that they're able to use that is maintained by Koreans, um, that when we look at the facilities that we have at a place like Camp Humphreys that are um, far better than some on my current installation, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think that there's much to be said, and, and those are the data points that I, as an operational commander, currently look at when I look at that situation, Senator. Well, as I conclude, you make a good point that you're not the negotiator, but the progress of that negotiation is going to have a huge impact on your ability to do your job and do it well. So we'll push the State Department and, uh, and, and everybody to conclude a deal that is very, very positive for the U.S. and Korea. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Senator Cotton, please. Gentlemen, welcome. Congratulations on your nomination. General Reed, I want to associate myself with everything Senator Kane just said uh, about the debacle of using that pier to try to supply Gaza, with the exception that it was Israel's responsibility. It's neither I nor our responsibility nor Israel's responsibility to provide for the people of Gaza. That would be Hamas, the de facto governing authority of it. Um, you said there's already an after-action review underway. That's your understanding, is that correct? Senator, it's my understanding that folks are looking at it. Um, I'm, uh, if, if confirmed, uh, I'll have visibility on how folks are looking okay. at that. Um, exactly what's being done, I would have to defer to CENTCOM. Okay, that. that's fine. But can we move from understanding to your commitment? Whatever it is that you find is underway that, that you're committed to actually having an after-action review that you'll report back to this committee either in person or with a written report? 
Senator, I'm committing to this committee, uh, if confirmed, my position as, as Transcom to uh, share with you what I discover and the impacts of that from Transcom. Okay, thank you. Um, Military Sea Lift Command recently announced plans to sideline 17 logistic ships because of a shortage of merchant mariners. Can you explain to us how the loss of those 17 ships might degrade Transcom's ability to s sustain military operations, both peacetime and wartime? Senator, what I can share with you on that is, uh, uh, being from the air component, what I understand is that uh, there is a little bit of an adjustment to make sure that the crews are available, can crew the ships. Uh, for the details of that, actually, I would have to defer to the Department of the United States Navy for that. Okay. If confirmed, can you come back to us um, after, say, 60 or 90 days with an answer about what you think the loss of those 17 ships means for our ability to sustain operations? Yes, Senator. Thank you. Uh, General Brunson, I want to speak about landmines. Landmines have been a critical part of defending the Korean Peninsula for decades now, um, essential to assuring that North Korea doesn't sweep into South Korea. The South Korean government has also stressed the importance of landmines. Do you agree that landmines continue to fulfill a critical battlefield need on the peninsula? Senator, having, having been up on the, the DMZ recently, they, they perform a, a very useful uh, purpose where they are laid in the demilitarized zone, as you well know, sir. Um, so yes, okay. I, I do believe they serve a purpose. And you believe that we should continue to employ them in that way at the DMZ? Senator, I believe that uh, if confirmed, what I would do is continue to assess that. If there are other means to mitigate that, to serve the same purpose and role that they are currently, then I'll look at that. But I believe that right now that they are serving the purpose they were intended okay. for. Are you aware of any other potential means besides the landmines? I'm not. I'm curious in your professional well, military judgment. Well, sir, yes. And and uh, I'm just going to take that for a question. There are, there are one-way munitions and things like that that could be used to, to provide the same purpose, sir. Okay. The reason I ask is that some people, to include some senators, but certainly some nations believe that we should withdraw all landmines and not use them anymore. And that may be nice if you live in Europe and think you're in the behind the gates of paradise, but someone has to guard the gates around the world. Um, North Korea has gotten more aggressive lately. They violated sanctions by sending all those missiles uh, and munitions to Russia fired ballistic missiles in the sea of North Korea, and they just recently decided to reveal their in uranium enrichment facility for the first time. Why, why do you think they did that? Senator, one of the things I think that continues to go on is, uh, especially in the more ephemeral domains, you know, EW, cyber, um, is we continue to maneuver in those spaces. And I think North Korea, in revealing something that they've generally hidden for years and years and years, is trying to uh, maneuver in the information space. And uh, to that end, if I'm confirmed, I have to take a look at how are we maneuvering in the information space to counter the narratives that are put forward by that. That causes tectonic shifts amongst the Korean people when they see another facility, because we all know that a, a facility that you can process uranium in is a facility that you can make warheads in. And so I think that by working closely with not only um, those uh, within the, the embassy spaces, but also working alongside Indo-PACOM um, and, and even U.S. Army Pacific, uh, I think that we can get toward alleviating some of the things that are being done there. For example, there's a theater information um, unit within U.S. Army Pacific, and those exist across our Army. Uh, I, first I owe command and others that can help us to message appropriately that we might maneuver as well. Any maneuver is met with other maneuver, and so we've got to meet them in that space and alleviate some of those challenges. Thank you. If, if I could conclude about the Brunson family. I, I know military service is often a family affair, in this country, but so your father, Sergeant Major Brunson, was a, a veteran of both Vietnam and the Gulf War. And Sergeant Major Brunson and Mrs. Brunson, you've raised three sons who have now all rose to the rank of Colonel and, and General Officer. Um, I just want to say it's a, a remarkable testament to you as parents. You must raise your kids right, and to all those families out there who don't come from a family like the Brunsons. Um, if you have any doubts about your child serving in our armed services, 
then you should look at what Sergeant Major and Mrs. Brunson have raised and know that it's a great choice for your family at a time when we're struggling to recruit who we need. We need more parents like Sergeant Major and Mrs. Brunson to encourage their kids to take the path you all have taken and serve this nation. So kudos to you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Uh, Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to both of you on your nominations and uh, aloha to your families who are here. I asked the following two initial questions of, of all nominees who come before any of my committees. And so I will ask you, and if you can respond first, General Reed and then General Basson. Uh, since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No, I have not. No, I have not. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No, I have not. No, I have not. For General Reed, uh, U.S. Transcom's ability to project and sustain military power around the globe is one of our asymmetric advantages. However, that advantage is at risk given the delayed recapitalization of the Ready Reserve Force. General Reed, one solution, if you can call it that, of expensive solution, uh, to this issue is bolstering our domestic shipbuilding capacity and making these ships in the United States. Another is giving the Navy authority to purchase more used vessels built in foreign shipyards. For example, the current version of the FY25 Senate NDAA increases that buying authority from nine to 12 ships. What do you think is the right approach, particularly for the long term? Senator, thank you for that question. For Sealift, Sealift is fundamental to what we do. This country has always been great primarily because we've been able to sail the seas. Um, and as we go forward, we need to maintain the capability to do just that. Um, the ages of our ships continue to increase. Uh, we have fantastic crews to cruise the ships. Uh, we do need to do some more work to recruit more. Um, however, uh, I think it would be easier to recruit more um, if we could get them newer equipment. And so to whatever we can do to bring down the ages of the ships, whatever we can do to put ships that are easier to repair would absolutely help. So in that regard, I know that, uh, that, that we've received permission to buy used. Um, that's for the near term. Um, in my view, uh, as an airman, uh, that would also help shipbuilding because that would actually put equipment in the shipyards to get people trained. And when we have the opportunity to actually buy new, then we actually have the industrial base to do that as well. So if confirmed as a transcom commander, um, I will ask all, uh, give us as much as we can get, whether it's used or new. <laughs> The, the difficulty is that there was a time when we had a, a much greater shipbuilding capacity in our own country. And as the shipyards closed, we're in the position of, of where you are, where we have to buy ships from uh, that are, that are uh, produced by other countries. So I, I think in the long term, I, I would really welcome, uh, the, basically the DOD should be thinking about how we can um, increase our domestic shipbuilding capacity. I think it is a, it's an expensive proposition, but one that's worth uh, pursuing. For General Bronson, we continue to hear about the importance of allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, and you responded to uh, what you would do if confirmed to make sure that our relationships with Japan and the Republic of Korea stay very strong. What other relationships in the region would you prioritize to deter North Korean aggression? Yes, Senator. Um, one of the things that, that I've found over the three years that I've been a Corps commander in the Pacific is um, sort of uh, like the field of dreams. When we have exercises, if we put the exercises together and we make means for people to contribute to those exercises in substantive ways, they continue to show up. So what we've got to look is uh, more multilateralism in our exercises to make room for our partners to participate in significant ways. Our posture is achieved by the locations where our partners are. That's how we have posture in the region. 
I also believe that uh, when we look at the difference in capacities, we can't be bound by that. We have to also understand that there are three levels of interoperability. Uh, technological interoperability is the height because we're asking you to use your resources to do things somewhere. But human and procedural interoperability are the things that we have to really focus on in the region to ensure that others show. Uh, Japan uh, and Korea are great examples of nations which are magnets uh, because of the exercises that they host in the, in the space they make for other partners. Um, we just did a, uh, an exercise talisman saber last year, Senator, where uh, the year prior, there were four nations there. Australia and the U.S. were two of four. Uh, last year, we had 15 nations there. Uh, everyone from Papua New Guinea to Ind Indonesia was there, but they were able to participate in substantive ways because we made space for them by ensuring that we could communicate in a secure fashion. I think that's very important. My time is um, running out, but uh, beyond Japan and Korea, you have the Philippines, you have uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, of course, Australia, New Zealand, India. So there are a lot of other countries and uh, island nations that I think we should be uh, uh, conducting uh, activities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Arono. Uh, Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Reed, General Brunson, for your service and for your willingness to keep going. Um, we need you badly, and thank you for stepping in the gap, and congratulations to both of you. Um, General Brunson, you may, you may know, or you may not, but you may know that in North Dakota, not only do we have two of the three legs of the nuclear triad based at Minot, but we have two very important ISR bases. In Grand Forks, the 100, 319th Reconnaissance Wing flies RQ-4s, uh, a lot of them in, in the area that you're, you're going. And then um, the 119th National Guard in Fargo flies MQ-9s around the world. In recent years, um, and in future years, it seems the Air Force is aggressively retiring some of these legacy systems with uh, not a lot to replace them. And I, I would just be interested in, in any thoughts you have about um, ISR uh, needs in, uh, in the indo pacom area and, and certainly the, the peninsula specifically, and whether those needs are being met, what you see going forward as, um, you know, capacity and, um, and just your general thoughts on, on airborne ISR and its availability to, to the fight. Uh, yes, Senator. So uh, when, when I look at the needs right now, uh, as an operational commander, I believe that General LaCamera has what he needs right now to help him to best understand his uh, operating environment, which now stretches in, in USFK, uh, a joint command. He's looking at He's looking at the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone. He's looking at the, uh, the Northern Limit Line. He's got to see all these things. And, and ISR is a technical means that allows him to see those things so that he might best understand his operating environment. I will tell you that if confirmed and, and allowed to serve or given the opportunity to serve as a commander of the Tri-Commands, that I would do much the same as continue to assess the needs of, of ISR that's meeting the requirements that we have across domains, mm -hmm. uh, the physical domains mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the KTO center. Well, it, along the same lines, and obviously um, space is becoming more and more, de we're becoming more dependent on space for uh, ISR. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on your relationship with General Whiting at Space Command, uh, General Salzman at Space Force, how, how you see the integration of space and whether or not that can fill the gap either in the short, mid or long term for ISR demand. Uh, Senator, I think space can do a great many things for us. As you know, there's a Space Force component in the headquarters at, uh, at USFK. Uh, I think it can give us a great many things, but as the Army has learned over time, there are, there's a need for a little bit more granularity than the bigger platforms of, of days gone by. And I think that, um, not to speak for services, but I know that uh, we're uh, achieving great, great results as we uh, continue to campaign through the Pacific and Operation Pathways by using small aperture UAS 
quadcopters and the like to be able to provide the granularity needed to finish actions. Uh, the find and the fix can be done by larger assets, but when it comes time to finish, which is the aim of our operations when we're on the ground, it, it takes something a little bit smaller. And I think that also as communications and our ability to see and understand our environments continues to improve, um, I think we're finding other ways to get at the information, the intelligence that we need to drive operations. Thank you. Um, G General Reed, G General er, Senator Kelly and I last week launched a new caucus called the Military Modernization Caucus. And what we're looking at is um, how, do we, how do we do things at the speed of, of the enemy, at the speed of China especially, uh, given the big bureaucracy and some of the cumbersome clumsiness of our, of our system. Um, by the way, certainly at the Department of Defense, but that would include Congress, I, I would say. Um, in, 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 as you look at, at your new mission soon, um, or your new job soon, can you think of any gaps in, in technology or um, modernization demands that, that we could be helpful with? And then and along the same lines, what can we be helpful with as Congress when it comes to getting you what you need? I, I very much appreciated your conversation with Senator Rono just a little bit ago. I found it very helpful. Um, as Senator Kane and I um, uh, are, are co-lead the uh, CPAR subcommittee. But in the airspace especially, there's probably some things we could be doing better and differently. Anything you can think of in a modernization uh, character or c category? Senator, I'd uh, like to begin from where I'm sitting now from an air component perspective. Mm. And being connected to the joint force uh, is very, very critical. Um, not just to be able to talk to others and not just being able to make sure that, uh, that they can talk to us, but the bottom line is uh, that equates to survivability. So when the force is connected and we're able to determine what's going on in the space, uh, where is uh, red, where is blue, where is the need, then we can make decisions at the speed of the war to actually outmaneuver the adversary. Um, if confirmed, moving to transcom, there is certainly room to get the rest of the force connected as well, because again, that equates to survivability. Very well said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Kramer. Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to associate myself with uh, Senator Cotton's comments. I haven't seen so many stars in one place since the last clear night in Maine. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to compliment the Brunson family for what you've achieved and the service you're providing to the country. Um, General Reed, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For want of the horse, the rider was lost. For want of the rider, the message was lost. For want of the message, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the country was lost, all because of the loss of one nail. I'm deeply worried about the adequacy of the industrial base, but also of the system that you have with private sector partners. And I hope that there is a profound testing process, a red team process, because in time of conflict, the first attack is gonna be on our logistics. Do you believe that the, uh, the command is up to that challenge? And are you taking steps to ensure that it's up to that challenge? Senator, uh, once again, I'll begin from an air component perspective. So from uh, where we sit now uh, with the funds that we have, we are very heavy into experimentation. Uh, we are actively seeking uh, technologies that are available today, uh, not necessarily things that are available in the future. Uh, data is one area uh, where we have uh, looked very deeply into uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, being able to what we call sense in seize. So the better we're able to sense the environment, uh, seize on the opportunities to actually get things done. From there, we've been looking to transition to airborne uh, tests to see uh, how can we get connected to the joint force, not just line of sight, but beyond as well. And then from there, how can we fast track some of this to the actual platforms? Um, obviously, if confirmed, uh, uh, running this to scale in Transcom would be key. Um, I must be uh, quick to mention also that uh, 
Transcom itself has been very supportive of us, and uh, they are doing much the same. Well, let me let me suggest, as several others have, if there are deficiencies, if you if you uh, red team and and assess your capacity and find it wanting, come to this committee. We don't want to be having hearings after the fact as why didn't we have sufficient air transportation or uh, maritime transportation. And that moved me to the next topic, which is cyber. Uh, again, uh, CIOs always say, yeah, we're okay, we're protected. You won't know that until you test it. And cyber, again, to go back to a conflict is going to be the first, the first step. So uh, I think this, the cyber uh, capacity and resiliency of your system is going to be of utmost importance and utmost vulnerability. Senator, yes, indeed it is. Um, just within the last few months, I had an opportunity to uh, join Transcom itself uh, in a two to three day session uh, here in the area at uh, Fort, Fort Meade. And uh, during that time with Cybercom, uh, I got exposed to a tremendous amount of work uh, that's already underway. Uh, if confirmed, uh, I'll be privy to more of that and uh, certainly something that's uh, very important for us. Thank you. I'm going to follow up with on several questions about moves in rural areas. We're worried about our Coast Guard personnel in Maine where the adequacy of the moving the household goods is a, is a problem. Uh, uh, General Brunson, the danger of accidental conflict in the Indo-Pacific. It's one of the things I worry the most about. A, a, a hot dog Chinese pilot miscalculates and takes the, the, the bridge off of a, of a destroyer. Uh, how do you assess that risk? And do we have the infrastructure in place to communicate with the Chinese or the North Koreans uh, that what is happening isn't a provocation, it's an accident? Senator, um, you know, the risk of miscalculation, it, it, it's ever present in the Pacific as wide and as vast as the Pacific is. We still find ourselves, whether it be in the, uh, the West Philippine Sea uh, with ships running into one another uh, or it be uh, along the um, exclusive economic zone there in the KTO. And I think that there are uh, ample uh, means of, of connection amongst leaders. Is um, there is there a, a hotline with with uh, with North Korea, for example, or or with I understand there's this been discussion with China on this issue, but nobody answers the phone. Uh, Senator, I, I can't answer that right now. Uh, I, I do know that up in Panmunjom, there is an area that's met meant for face-to-face -face consultation if needed. Um, but at, at this current time, it's, it's not within the realm of my duties to, to oh, know that. I, I hope when you take over your due duties, that's something you'll look into because uh, accidental conflict is a serious potential problem. And one way to resolve that is some kind of deconfliction infrastructure, which I hope you'll pursue both from your p point of view, but also uh, within the Department of Defense and, and the, uh, the administration. Senator, uh, if confirmed, I will. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, one comment on household moves. I used to work for a company that moved household goods for service people. I have been known to carry a few boxes. I recommend boxes with lampshades rather than books. That was my experience. Uh, but one, one uh, military spouse t told me years ago that they considered seven moves equals a fire. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, Senator Bud, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, General Brunson, uh, I was reading your remarks, was able to listen to them, and I think it bears repeating uh, the more than 130 years of combined service of your family, uh, starting with your dad. Um, retired Sergeant Major Brunson and continue with you, your brothers and your wife. Um, you set a great example, so thank you. Um, now, if I understand correctly, you were born and raised in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yes, I didn't sir. see that in your remarks, but uh, uh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about the time that you've uh, served, uh, I think even with your, your brothers, maybe all of you were there at one point. Tell us a little bit about what you learned growing up North Carolina um, and some of the values you're going to bring into this job, if confirmed. Uh, yes, Senator, um, thank you for your recognition of my family. 
very important to me. That's a thing I learned in North Carolina. I also learned in Cumberland County how to pick strawberries without crushing them. And that if you <laughs> get your bucket filled faster, you can eat more than the folks that are putting their buckets up on the truck. Um, my grandmother taught me industry early on in my life. So I know what it's like to pick cucumbers or pick uh, strawberries and, and cabbage and everything else. What I learned in North Carolina is industry, that if you work for it, you can get it, you can have it. Uh, I learned uh, early on as well that um, the great state of North Carolina and the great people of North Carolina are very forgiving. And uh, I think that uh, one of the things that I have on my desk speaks to North Carolina. It says, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. And that's what I've always found. Uh, my wife and I, as we've moved around in the Army, have often thought, number one, there's no sweet tea here. And number two, um, folks just aren't like Carolina people. There used to be a WRAL commercial a long time ago that said, I like calling North Carolina home. And uh, that's what it was for me. What I also learned militarily is that the center of the universe, as it used to be called at Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty, um, there are a host of forces there, both airborne and special operations, who come together to achieve great effect for our nation. And I've tried to template that on everything in every unit I've been to, to include currently within my core, trying to ensure that First Corps can place combat credible forces west of the IDL. I think that's my part of the job. That's my part of the task. I learned that in North Carolina because integrated assurance for our partners is just as important as the deterrence piece. There are policy makers and, and more senior leaders who will ensure that deterrence is in alignment, that we can do things like extended deterrence. But my job as an operational commander currently is to assure our friends, partners, and allies that we will be there, we'll be present, we'll be engaged, we'll continue to foster human and procedural interoperability to allow them to live and thrive in a free and open Indo-Pacific, sir. Thank you, General. So what do you, as you look at the growing adversary relationship between um, China, Russia, North Korea, what? Does that growing relationship between um, our adversaries, what challenges and opportunities uh, does that present? Yes, sir. So, Senator, one of the things I look at is where are the fissures in those relationships? Yeah. There is no true alignment of um, what, and I'll just say simply, Senator, we are the partner of choice for a reason because we look at as a nation, we generally look at the interest of those we're working alongside and where that intersection lies, we begin to work from, uh, that's our point of departure on building a relationship. Um, the relationship between the DPRK, China and Russia seems to be far more quid pro quo. Uh, this is what we need, this is what we're gonna give you in return. Uh, I had a, a great conversation with Chairman Reed yesterday and we talked about uh, one of the things that's just as important as what's going out is what's coming back in. And I think that's where we have to become more astute in being able to divine what our enemies are doing, what they're receiving, what might come of those things. But, but I think that uh, being the partner of choice in the region is really what we're after, sir. Thank you, General. Uh, General Reed, again, thank you for being here and congratulations on your nomination. So if confirmed, you'd have responsibility for Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point in North Carolina, the largest military terminal in the world and a critical ammunition shipping point on the East Coast. So if confirmed, do you commit to staying in close touch to ensure Sunny Point's infrastructure and systems remain modern, cyber resilient, and physically secure? Yes, Senator, I do. It's vital for us. Well, thank you. I look forward to uh, many conversations about that and uh, hopefully working together with both of you. Thank you both. Thank you, Senator Butt. Senator Duckworth, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to both of our witnesses. Welcome to you and your families and congratulations on your nominations. General Reed, thank you for our conversation uh, uh, last week. And if confirmed, I look forward to working with you to ensure that Transcom is resourced at the levels necessary to project and sustain the joint force that at our nation's choosing. 
This ability is key to our strategic deterrence, especially in the Indo-Pacific AOR. I am very proud of Transcom, proud to host it in my home state um, uh, with its headquarters there at Scott Air Force Base. Um, I am the fiercest advocate for Transcom on this committee and the work that you are doing there at Transcom to support operations around the globe, including in Ukraine, the Middle East, and Indo-Pacific region is second to none. Now, as the global patient movement manager for DOD, Transcom has a vital role in providing medical care for our service members through designated aeromedical evacuation hubs and patient reception areas. This role is critical for moving a large number of service members from overseas theaters to treatment centers in CONUS. I've discussed the need to improve DOD's medical readiness in the Indo-Pacific with every service chief and combatant commander who comes before this committee. And I would like to discuss my uh, FY25 NDAA proposal to create an Indo-Pacific medical readiness program and it was included in the SASC markup, committee markup. This proposal would address current gaps in DOD's medical capacity in the Indo-Pacific region. It is aimed at ensuring our nation's service members as well as their families have access to high quality US standard medical care throughout the region. The program would authorize DOD to access foreign medical facilities in the Indo-Pacific and DOD would work with our allies and partners to accredit those facilities thus increasing the number of available medical facilities DOD personnel would have access to during peacetime and in the event of a conflict abroad. I'm gonna um, direct my question first at General Brunson. Um, General Brunson, DOD already has a version of this in the Republic of Korea. In fact, it is the only place where we have this uh, arrangement. Um, the, in fact, the United States helped set up the Aju Trauma Center in Suwon, and it was modeled like a US trauma center um, because there is a doctor there, Dr. Lee Guk Jong, who received training from U.S. surgeons, and he set up this level one trauma center there um, to U.S. standards and is JCO certified. And in 2017, he was able to leverage that training uh, that he received in the U.S. to treat the North Korean soldier who defected at the Aju Trauma Center, saving his life. Uh, General Brunson, if confirmed, can you speak to how you would leverage my Indo-Pacific Medical Readiness Program and speak to the significance of DOD having access to ROK medical facilities that meet US standards in the event of a kinetic conflict? It, yes, Senator. Um, one of the things that we we are trying to, to even work now at Joint Base Lewis-McChord is um, the impact of care being needed for our, our service members, their families, and our veterans in a hospital that is a magnet for the state of Washington, and how we might also replicate role two and one and threes forward in the theater, because as you know, the distances are great. Um, the need for host, host nation um, medical care is something that's also got to be assessed. And Senator, if I'm confirmed, I will continue to assess the location and the depth with which in the services provided because uh, DHA is also over on the peninsula and we've got to tie all that together in a means that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. because we, we need it in, in competition, we need it in conflict, and we will certainly need it when crisis arises. And it would be another way for us to forge even closer bonds if we are using uh, uh, um, this process to have our military medical personnel work with their military pers medical personnel and have that habitual training relationship in that, in that area. Yes, Senator. Thank you. Um, General Reed, if confirmed, can you commit to ensuring that my Indo-Pacific medical readiness program will be a priority for Transcom? Absolutely, Senator. Uh, having served abroad in, uh, with the family and without, and having served abroad in a place where there's no base, uh, this would be very welcome. Thank you. And if confirmed, how will you work with Indo-PACOM to ensure we continue exercising aeromedical evacuation patient movement routes with our allies and partners in the region, including our ASEAN partners? Uh, Senator, if confirmed, uh, I don't think that will be much of an issue. Uh, I think the theater will find it very welcome that we will want to partner with them in that. Uh, last summer, as a matter of fact, we did just that. We participated with them uh, across the entire summer. And uh, in that, we were with seven partner nations. And one of the primary things that we worked on was air medical evacuation. Uh, during that time, uh, not only did we train together and fly sorties together, but we were able to use each other's equipment. And uh, it was uh, very, very, very helpful. Thank you. And I look forward, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. 
Um, but I am looking forward to um, discussing with you about your key priorities for improving surface distribution, logistics within the continental US, specifically with regard to rail and the commercial trucking industry and how timely movement of supplies to ports will be critical in the event of conflict in the Indo-Pacific region. But we'll, we'll take that offline uh, once you're confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Uh, Senator Scott, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first, I want to thank, congratulate both of you on your nomination. If you look at your background, you clearly can do these jobs. Um, your family should be very impressed uh, with what you've already accomplished. You should be very proud of your accomplishments, and I know you're both going to do a great job. Um, General Reed, uh, I understand the, good, the global household goods contract recently changed. Um, so we just finished peak moving season. Can you talk a little bit about the contract's implementation, what you're seeing, how it's, how it's working? Senator, what I understand so far, uh, uh, we began in uh, the spring, uh, as you mentioned, uh, went through the peak season uh, in select locations and the feedback that I'm getting is things are going well. Um, I understand feedback has come in uh, from families and also from uh, transportation providers uh, who were not in the system before. Uh, part of the improvement that seems to uh, have really resonated with the families is the fact that uh, uh, using IT systems, uh, they can actually tell uh, where their household goods are and they can actually see uh, the position of the folks who actually have their goods. All right, thank you. Do you know when we'll know how much we spent on the Gaza Pier? Uh, Senator, at this time, I don't have that information. Do you, do you have any idea when we'll find out? Senator, at this time, I do not. Okay, good, thanks. Um, the, um, General Brunson, thank you for taking the call yesterday. Um, Hannah's here with me. Thank you for taking her, her uh, question seriously, and, and, I, and thank you for your willingness to look into it and see what you can, uh, what you can do to be helpful. Um, I, I had the opportunity, like a lot of us have been to South Korea, I went to Camp Humphreys, uh, celebrate the 4th um, last year. So we have 28,000 service members in South Korea. Can you just talk about, if you're going to talk to the American public about the importance of being in South Korea, about what the relationship is like with the government of South Korea, how are they a good partner, uh, is it a fair relationship, uh, is it, how important is it to our national security, things like that. Yes, Senator. Uh, you know, as, as a Corps commander currently, as a sitting Corps commander, I've had that very same conversation. Uh, the things that we do forward prevent things from happening in the homeland. Uh, defense of the homeland is, is, is a key, key task that I've got to accomplish. It's, it's a no-fail task, even as a Corps commander. Uh, I would explain to them that by us being forward postured, our posture forward allows us to be inside of uh, the air defense exclusionary zone. It allows us to be able to, if need be, move to conflict. It allows us to establish for ourselves posture and protection and sustainment uh, that our homeland not be brought at risk. It's one of those things that you'd be hard pressed to get someone in St. Augustine where my family lives to understand but it should be of supreme importance to them that there are men and women, 28,500, which is the floor, not the ceiling, who are there prepared to not only defend our ally in Korea, but to defend, uh, really support and defend the Constitution of the United States and defend her people, wherever they might be. Uh, I would also tell you that there's a, there's something to be said for the will and the resolve of a nation when we take our families and place them in that same environment and uh, entrust their care to not only our ally, for our ally doing what they say they're gonna do, but for us to be good for what we say we're gonna do as well, sir. How is, uh, is South Korea a good partner? Yes, sir, they are. And do they, do they feel like they, um, they bear their part of the burden? Sir, when I look at uh, the way that APS4 is maintained, when I look at Camp Humphreys itself, which you've seen, um, those are facilities the likes of which uh, we, we don't even have on Joint Base lewis McCord right now. We're moving toward it. But uh, in the past two years where I've gone over for exercises in the Republic of Korea, what I've seen is uh, a diligence the likes of which I would love to see on my Joint Base. Uh, we see the Koreans erecting facilities. We just opened recently 
um, there in Korea, three new towers for family housing. Uh, and that says something when those things uh, go from design to, or decision to design to actual brick and mortar going up. So, so yes, Senator, I would say they are uh, good partners. And Senator, if I may add, uh, they also have a counterpart to Transcom, and that commander has a relationship with ours. Uh, in addition, they have a liaison that's in the headquarters at tr Transcom. Uh, that individual uh, spends time and is able to attend each and everything to make sure that we stay tied. And uh, in terms of being a great partner, uh, very nuanced support even for the annual West Point Annapolis football game. <laughs> thanks, Bubble Steve. Thanks for your service. You guys are you guys are going to do a great job. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Brunson, General Reed, congratulations to both of you, General Reed. Um, I uh, I'm the only uh, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy graduate uh, in Congress currently, and I pay close attention to the strength of our merchant marine and our maritime industry. China's the world's largest shipbuilder and controls the most merchant ships in the world with over 5,500 vessels. There are just 80 merchant ships flying under the American flag in international commerce, 80. I'm concerned that the size and capability of the U.S. merchant fleet is a danger to our national security. As you know, Insufficient commercial maritime capacity impacts peacetime trade and supply chains, and it will hamper our ability to supply our own troops in a conflict. This isn't a capability that we can turn on overnight. We need investments now to be ready for tomorrow. That's why I'm developing legislation to rebuild our commercial maritime industry and our U.S. Uh, flagged international fleet. General Reed, can you explain how the lack of a commercial shipbuilding industry here at home and a lack of U.S. flagged commercial ocean going vessels is having real impacts on our national security and U.S. Transcom's strategic sea lift capability? Senator, it might actually surprise you to know there was a time where I actually considered going to that academy. <laughs> um, Growing up in Hampton Roads, uh, I fully understand the importance of sea lift and that force. Uh, if confirmed as a transcom commander, uh, there is no way that I can do my mission without the commercial industry. Uh, the fact that you just mentioned legislation, I'm not sure what's in it, but I think that absolves me of uh, one instance of asking for help from this committee. Um, I know that we need to grow that force. Uh, that force is very vital. And uh, thank you for that help in advance. I'll also share with you just within the last week, I happened to have a conversation with a father of two merchant mariners. Uh, very proud, they're very young, they are within their first eight years. And uh, they're very, very positive about their service, but obviously they hear things from the other sailors. And so, uh, and, and, and so they, they get the noble service, they want to have folks behind them. Um, and, and, and their father is very, very proud of what they do. If confirmed, you have my commitment for that because that's a vital part of the force that we have. It's the decisive force that we have. And I also make a commitment to be very visible in the public space to inspire folks to serve there as well. Well, General, I look forward to working with you on this comprehensive legislative effort to, to fix this. And also, you know, we're gonna need to create a business case so U.S. flagged carriers and companies can su succeed economically. Uh, General Brunson. Um, you get, you're going into an incredibly important job, uh, and it's vital to uh, one of our strongest allies in South Korea. And I'm uh, seriously concerned about North Korea's weapons trade with Russia. They're providing advanced short-range ballistic missiles uh, that are being used to kill Ukrainians and undermine uh, regional security. Our South Korea partners are telling us that North Korea's factories are now operating at full capacity. Uh, so they can keep supplying Russia. They've sent over 16,000 containers of munitions to Russia, and Russia has launched dozens of North Korean missiles into Ukraine. It's unclear what North Korea is getting from this cooperation, but I'm concerned that Russia 
will provide them with more advanced military technology. And we've got to do what we can to cur curtail these illegal arms transfers. They're killing Ukrainians and they're harming the security of our allies. So General Brunson, can you provide your thoughts on the impact of these weapons transfers from North Korea and how concerned should we be about North Korea receiving advanced technology uh, from Russia? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, I, I believe, uh, first of all, on the, uh, the first point that you made, uh, I, I would just uh, again echo that South Korea is uh, one of our preeminent allies, uh, one of our finest. And the exchange of lethal aid between the DPRK and Russia is a thing to be alarmed about. Uh, but most importantly, what we have to do is see what's coming back in. And in order to see that, Senator, it, it's going to take the IC to help us to see and understand what's coming back. Um, because if confirmed, my job as a USFK commander would be to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, is part of our, our plans. Our plans have to address that, that we might be able to assure our partner that we've thought through these things. Um, in, these technologies may affect even things like NEO which is another mission that we've got to be able to accomplish there on the peninsula. Um, you have uh, my promise to continue to, if confirmed, to assess uh, the threat as it is uh, and assess the risk and then report back to the Indo-PACOM commander all the way up through the chairman on what we are seeing uh, based on our engagement, not only with the IC, but our engagement in our operating environment, Senator. Thank you, General. Then we got to figure out what to do about it. So we'll be able to, you know, with the information from the IC, figure out what the risk is to uh, South Korea and to the region and to our own national security. And then we'll figure out what the response needs to be to try to mitigate that risk. Yes, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and uh, both of you. Gentlemen, thank you for uh, your service uh, to, to our country. General Reid, during uh, uh, their testimony before uh, this committee, uh, uh, General um, Alvin and Secretary Hunter shared that the, uh, the Air Force is exploring uh, using KC-46s uh, as a communications uh, node in addition to their, their tanker responsibilities. Um, uh, and they've uh, explored that during a recent mobility guardian exercise, I believe. Uh, I believe this is a positive step, and, uh, and I've been pushing uh, the Air Force to think outside of the box about the potential uh, for KC-46 refueling tankers uh, to use uh, and command uh, perhaps a collaborative combat aircraft uh, in far-ranging uh, missions. So my question for you, General Reed, is how do enhanced uh, communication capabilities on our tanker aircraft uh, assist TRANSCOM's global missions? And additionally, how can TRANSCOM work with the Air Force to plan for potential uh, CCAs uh, and KC-46's uh, interoperability? Senator, connectivity is key uh, for all the platforms and, uh, and for uh, most of the air mobility fleet, uh, they're not as connected as they could be, uh, although things are starting to change. Um, in terms of the uh, information node, uh, currently most airplanes can only communicate with each other line of sight, so they have to be very close to each other. Um, what we really need is the ability to communicate beyond that and stay connected to the entire force. Uh, our adversaries are developing technologies that, are, uh, that have greater range, uh, which puts us uh, more and more into the, the contested environment. Um, but we're going to have to be there and we're going to have to have ways in order to make sure that we can open up an opportunity to continue to support the joint force. Um, in that communication node, uh, it not only allows the crew to be aware of what's going on in the space, but in the absence of others who cannot control, they can actually contribute to the fight. Uh, and so that's incredibly key. Uh, Senator, to your question for CCAs, um, a little bit premature for me to determine uh, what, what's in that space, but I'll tell you, if anything is in the air and it can respond to the needs of the joint force that's in the air and, and can contribute to survivability, uh, absolutely, I'll take it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, General uh, Brinson, um, uh, I recently uh, returned uh, from South Korea with several of my colleagues where we met with uh, 
government and military officials there. Uh, and uh, we were fortunate to see firsthand the importance uh, of uh, this uh, relationship uh, to a free and uh, open Indo-Pacific. Uh, while there, uh, among many topics that we discuss discussed, we also discussed the growing cooperation between American and Korean universities and government organizations. Uh, this uh, collaboration uh, includes a recently announced uh, partnership uh, between uh, the University of uh, Michigan, uh, Hyundai Heavy Industries, and Seoul National University to cultivate and to expand uh, U.S. Uh, shipbuilding expertise by developing uh, specialized uh, training uh, programs. So my question for you, sir, is if confirmed, uh, how will you use your role as commander for the U.S. Forces Korea to expand and foster uh, similar relationships uh, between Korea and the United States? Yes, Senator. Um, my, my daughter, Rebecca, attended Seoul National University. Uh, and so I'm very well familiar with them and their reputation and what they produce at that institution. Uh, currently as a Corps commander, I've built uh, several relationships with local universities um, because they are able to see things in ways that we can't or don't or don't have time to investigate or champion. Uh, we built a Pacific education program and an engagement program which brought academia forward on our exercises to answer some of the strategic questions that we had. I would very much see myself leveraging um, the, the, the brain power of, the, of institutions, not only in Korea, but here in the United States to help us solve some of our most uh, compelling issues. Uh, it's one thing to just use PEMTEC or the Pacific multi-domain uh, training and experimental capability. It's another thing entirely to think about new ways of doing things. I think academia can help us to challenge some of our assumptions and at little cost, truthfully. Uh, vice going on into some new technical solution for a problem that maybe we haven't thought fulsome enough about. So that's how I would do it, Senator, if confirmed. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Peters. Uh, I believe Senator Gillibrand is prepared to go, and then we'll recognize Senator Schmidt. Senator Gillibrand, please. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and congratulations, generals, for these appointments, and um, best wishes to your families that are here. Um, we know none of us do these jobs on our own, so having the support of our families really does make a difference. Um, General Reed, we have repeatedly heard that in the event of a crisis or conflict, the Chinese government will target critical infrastructure in the U.S. in part to disrupt the ability of the U.S. to respond. As Deputy Commander of Air Mobility Command, how have you sought to ensure the availability of your fleet and your systems in the event of such an attack? And how would you approach this challenge as Transcom Commander? Senator, uh, first and foremost, we've focused really hard on making sure that the force is ready and they understand what's required of them. Um, when we do that and we give them the chance to exercise, uh, a lot of times they find out ways to get around the d disruptions themselves, and then we take those lessons and we roll them up. Uh, the next thing that we do is we exercise realistically, and we're uh, putting ourselves under pressure to exercise with problems, uh, to exercise with an incomplete force, to exercise with incomplete information. And so with that, we get the lessons learned and, and we get to try it real time uh, in terms of what would happen in the case of crisis and conflict. Uh, if confirmed going into Transcom, Transcom already does some of that, but there's opportunities to scale and there's opportunities to do that, not just in the air, but in the other modes as well. Um, how would Transcom leverage artificial intelligence technology to improve day-to-day -day operations? I've seen how AI can impact the private sector in terms of getting supplies where it needs to go around the globe. Is that something that um, the military and Transcom will consider using? Absolutely, Senator. And from an air component perspective, we do much the same. Uh, we are looking into the future in terms of how we can turn unstructured data into structured and then use that to present information for us to sense things and then make decisions. At the same time, we're using it real world to uh, make decisions on the operational floor. Thank you. General Brunson, um, I also had the occasion to take a um, Senate trip to South Korea and Japan. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, how important is our alliance with South Korea? And um, under the Biden administration, historic progress was made 
we're building a trilateral relationship between South Korea, Japan, and the U.S. Can you talk about how you would seek to deepen that? And last, um, can you please speak to the threat that North Korea ballistic missile capabilities um, create and what your approach may be? I think I, I, think I got it, Senator. Um, <laughs> The, the relationship is, is very important, especially, uh, Senator. Um, one of the things that we have to look at is opportunities vice the challenges presented by uh, malign acts. And we have to separate the acts from the actors who are involved in the things going on in the region. And if we do that, what we start to understand is, what we discover is, is that um, the impacts are felt by nations around the region. Uh, Indo-PACOM, says a free and open Indo-Pacific is what they are charged to provide. And we do that for our friends, partners, and allies in the region. The, the relationship between the ROK and, and the Japanese is, is huge. We just had our chairman over there conducting a, a historic, an historic uh, trilateral uh, a meeting. Uh, I think also what it does is it changes the math problem that is DPRK sitting in the north, moving south, and uh, the Republic of Korea sitting in the south, going north with CFC. It changes that. Um, I think that more often than not, as malign acts happen in the region, it draws nations, like-minded nations together. And uh, the Japan, US, uh, Republic of Korea, uh, relationship can serve as a magnet for other nations that just want to live. Uh, they they want to fish in the waters off their coast. They don't want to be threatened. They don't want to be under duress every day. Um, so the true importance of that is showing nations that they can stand together outside of, of, of a large construct that says this is who we are and this is what we do, but just folks who come together, stitching together those mutual defense treaties that exist in the region and saying, we're gonna be there. We're gonna assure you that we will be there and we will do the things as a nation that we said we were gonna do. We'll demonstrate our resolve there, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Joe Lebrand. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to you both. I, I missed the intro, but I guess this is your family's back here. Congratulations. Um, I know that Senator Peters, um, I think he asked you, uh, General Brunson, this question. So I want to pose it to you, General Reed. On, I was also on that trip to uh, Codel to South Korea or to Republic of Korea and uh, in Japan. It was illuminating. Uh, a topic that came up over and over was, you know, is relates to our industrial base and making sure we have more shipbuilding and maintenance capacity. Um, what role do you see um, that? Republic of Korea and, and various entities could play in the Indo-Pacific and in helping out in, in really these capacity issues that we have. Thank you, Senator. I'll tell you, uh, Transcom's role and Transcom's mission is simply not possible with allies and partners. Uh, when we talk about being able to deliver to the point of need, um, especially for him, if he gets concern, uh, confirmed, uh, he's going to be relying on Transcom to make the strategic delivery to then get to where he is and then to bridge the seams to the system that he has. That would not be possible without the host nation that is hosting him. Uh, in order for us to fly our aircraft, allies and partners actually give us access to the airspace. Um, and so there are a multitude of contributions that they make just for the access and the basing, but we also rely on them for their infrastructure. And so that's an air base, that's a seaport, that's fuel storage, and the list goes on and on and on. And so in order to get this job done, uh, having friends and having partners to help is how we win. I also see that as being our fundamental advantage against our adversaries. We simply have more friends than they. Yeah, and, and General Brunson, if you want to add, I know that you answered this with some uh, or, uh, uh, Peter, so I can get briefed on it later. I don't want to have you repeat yourself, but that partnership is really important, but particularly on this maintenance issue, right? Uh, and by the way, our European allies, I think, have a lot to learn about burden sharing from the Republic of Korea. The, the percentage of their GDP they actually spend on defense, including that new airfield that's been constructed, there's a lot that, that uh, NATO allies can learn from that. But did you want to chime in on that? 
It, yes, Senator, I did. Because uh, what, what, uh, what I think Randy brings up, to be quite honest with you, is, is the transition from strategic movement to operational maneuver. Once something hits the peninsula, there's got to be an operation that takes care of that. Uh, we benefit greatly, uh, and I mentioned earlier to Senator Peter's question, APS4 and how that's maintained in a marvelous fashion for us. But I think that uh, there ought to be assessments done with where can Randy get things to have confirmed and where do we need to take that as part of the theater responsibility to move to provide onward movement and integration into the theater of that materiel. Um, I w one last question I wanted to ask um, uh, General Reed. There's been reports, <clears throat> and I know there's been hearings about this, been reports about um, Chinese cargo cranes um, at various ports posing an espionage risk, number one, and number two, perhaps even debilitating some of our critical infrastructure to sort of follow up on Senator Gillibrand's question. What do you know about that? What can be done about that? That's a lot. That's concerning because uh, the CCP is continuing to try to acquire access to ports that we use. Um, and if either one of you want to chime in on this, this seems to be kind of a big deal <laughs> um, that there's not a lot of discussion about and just how you see that and some of the things that we might be able to do to thwart those efforts. Senator, I'm aware of the concern. Uh, I know that uh, Transcom is aware of the concern and they are, there are some things that they are doing for that. Uh, from the air component perspective, um, I'm not privy deep into that, but if confirmed, uh, absolutely. That's fair. That would be something sure. I'm into. General. Yes, sir, as, we, uh, as, as you may or may not know, we are wholly reliant on the ports of Olympia, Tacoma, and some a little bit further north of us um, as far as S-pods go within uh, Washington State. Uh, we've taken, um, we recognize the fact that the vulnerability is the ports and the networks at the port. Um, your internet might be more secure than uh, in your home than it is at some of our ports and facilities. And so I, I think that uh, wherever we are looking to push men, women, and materiel from, we've got to look at um, how do we harden those sites that they might not be vulnerable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Schmidt. Senator Rosen, please. Well, thank you, Chairman Reed, uh, and of course, uh, Ranking Member Wicker uh, for holding this hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses, of course, for testifying, for your willingness to serve, and for your service so far. I want to talk to you first, General Reed, about cyber resiliency. And I want to build upon an important topic brought up by members on this committee because cybersecurity threats, well, they continue to grow both in scale and sophistication. They pose significant threats to the operational resilience of our global logistics and transportation networks. So I have a kind of a three-part question for you. Um, and uh, I did a little disaster recovery back in a long time ago when I was a young computer programmer. But if confirmed, how are you going to ensure that your command is prepared to, number one, defend against, number two, operate through, and number three, recover from cyber attacks. And we'll leave the long-term implications of cyber attacks uh, somewhere else because it depends what the attack is for sure. But defend against, operate through, and recover. Uh, if you could talk about that, please. Cyber resilience, Senator, begins with hygiene and um, understanding uh, what the networks are, what's connected to what, and how to keep the information clean is key. Um, and so I'm aware that Transcom does that as well as all of the other components. Uh, and then good, just fundamental training uh, with that as well and being responsible with the information. Additionally, since cyber is so connected between the government and the commercial world, having good quality relationships with the commercials is fundamental. Um, in that, as part of the National Defense Transportation Association, there's actually a subcommittee specifically for cyber. And in that, all of the players uh, who operate air, sea, rail, uh, whatever mode, are part of that committee. And we share best practices and we do a lot of crosstalk. At the same time, there are pieces of the government who can offer help if the companies want it. 
And then in the contracts that we let for their support, uh, we mandate that they have to have a certain level of resiliency with that. Uh, recovery is all mission focused in understanding that we are a contribution to an agile lethal force. Um, it's just one of those things that we're going to do, one of those things we have to do, one of those things we work through each day. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna turn to you, uh, General Brunson. We're gonna talk about military family resistance, uh, uh, resilience, excuse me. And uh, speaking about families, it is really wonderful and obvious to see how much uh, you care about your family, how much they care about you as your family proudly surrounds and supports you here today. Uh, like all of us, we're lucky enough to be blessed with a supportive family. It is a good and powerful thing. And uh, I'm gonna say to your parents, Good job. Um, but if confirmed, uh, they're gonna remain an important pillar of support, I know, for you and the forces you lead. But the U.S. Forces Korea maintains a fight tonight mission that not only requires readiness of our forces to mobilize at a moment's notice, but also, again, we talk about resilience and preparedness of our families, right? So these families play a critical role in supporting our service members, their ability to stay focused, their ability to stay mission ready. So some US forces in Korea are accompanied by their families, not everybody, of course we know that, but in both scenarios, it's critical for service members to know that their families will be both safe and taken care of should a military uh, emergency arise. So if confirmed, for families that are in Korea, how will you prioritize family resilience, family safety as part of the overall fight tonight strategy? And what steps will you take to ensure military families are equipped and prepared for any scenarios that they might be faced during a heightened time of military tension or military conflict? Uh, Senator, uh, one, one of the, the things that's, that's most important is, um, I believe it's General Odierno who used to say that the soldier is the strength of the nation and the family is the strength of the soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that, and if confirmed, I think that one of the, the, the best steps that I could take is to communicate freely, openly, and often with the families of the affected tri-commands. Uh, I think that information uh, and the ability to explain to um, to folks the things that, that they are giving their lives to and what it means, what it requires, and uh, what's required of them and what them wearing the uniform denotes every day. Uh, I think that, that those are things that we have to do. It's also equipping um, the installation with the, the resources and programs mm -hmm. that help families to feel as if they're at home. Mm -hmm. uh, the, specter, the specter of conflict or crisis is always going to be there, but it's very important for us to have our families there that soldiers might be stable. That's right. I, I know for a fact it confirmed that my wife and my son are coming with me. Uh, that changes things for me. That adds to my resilience. That adds to my... Uh, the, the strength of this soldier is, is improved every day I'm with my family. Um, but there are things that, that I think as a commander, I'll have to continually assess. Uh, how are we doing it? Could we be doing this better? Mm -hmm. How are our families faring? How are our schools? How are our hospitals? Uh, how are our folks integrated into the community? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I believe that the facilities that exist um, there at Camp Humphreys or without peer. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always time to continue to assess and look at these things to ensure that our soldiers are able to do their best job. It's 28,500, which is a floor, but there's families beyond that that all have to be cared for in the same way we care for weapon systems, material, and equipment. That's right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you both. My time uh, is over. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. I will note that there is a vote on the floor. Uh, Senator Sullivan is recognized uh, Thank for you, Mr. Chairman. five minutes at least. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses for their excellent service to our country and uh, their families for their great service and support of them as well. Very much appreciated. Um, General Reed, I want to dig into the issue of air refueling. The current Transcom commander, General Van Ovos, testified in her April hearing before this committee that air 
Aerial refueling was among her top readiness concerns. You expressed uh, similar concerns in your advanced policy questions. The importance of air refueling, something that my state, state of Alaska is very familiar with, Alaska-based tankers, more than tankers based anywhere else in the country are currently executing real world missions in support of our national defense st strategy's number one priority, which is defense of the homeland. As I'm sure you've seen just in the last couple of weeks, uh, our KC-135s, which are associated with our Air National Guard, um, have been performing at the highest level of readiness, intercepting uh, Russian fighters just last weekend, intercepting joint Russian-Chinese strategic bombers coming into our aid is five weeks ago, uh, intercepting and shooting down Chinese spy balloons over Alaska. This is all done with our tankers. And then, of course, when we have red flag up in Alaska, the tankers are hugely needed for that massive exercise. It's been going on all summer, northern edge as well. And then... As you know, General, um, any uh, indo pacom conflict there, uh, the forces are going to flow from the lower 48 through Alaska over to the indo pacom As General Van Ovos, Ovos said, air refueling is foundational to our nation's power projection advantage. It is our most stress capability. One of my concerns, and if confirmed, I want to get your commitment to work with me on this, I have gone through Air Force leadership, General C.Q. Brown when he was Chief of the chief of Staff of the Air Force, the current Secretary of the Air Force, the last Secretary of the Air Force, saying, hey, Senator, we know you need more tankers in Alaska. Makes strategic sense. KC-46s? Oh, maybe not. KC-135s? Oh, we'll get four to you. Oh, maybe not. So it's been a real frustration of mine because strategically, the leadership I talked to in the Air Force is saying, 100% we need more tankers in Alaska. So what's your view on where we are with regard to tankers for the country in Alaska? And can I get your commitment if confirmed to work with me on this? It's been a frustration of mine. Secretary of the Air Force, a couple of years ago, General C.Q. Brown, a couple of years ago said, hey, we're not, we're not gonna do KC-46s in Alaska. It doesn't make sense to me. I had a lot of four stars saying, of course we are. I'm, but we'll, we're going to bring KC-135s there. Now we're not doing that. I'm frustrated. I've been working on this issue for six years. And it makes strategic sense what I'm talking about. So can I get your commitment to work with me on this? And um, if confirmed, because uh, it's a huge issue f for Transcom. And by the way, you, the Transcom service members do such a great job. But do you have any thoughts on this, General? Senator, my reflections on this uh, stems from my years of operating there off and on. And so uh, I know you also have concerns on the operating conditions in the high north and what our outstanding forces do when they're operating up there. Um, and in flying transports and air refueling, um, I fully understand the importance of Alaska, importance of the region. Very, very proud of the airmen who have supported the fighters to protect the country and um, very, very valuable piece of land um, there. Senator, uh, it, as you can tell from General Van Ovost and the statements that I made in my policy questions, uh, tankers are absolutely vital and fundamental. Uh, we cannot maneuver the force. We cannot res respond at the speed that we need to without a healthy tanker fleet. And if confirmed, uh, one of the main things I'll do is I'll continue to push and advocate for making that, that fleet stronger. Uh, in terms of where the tankers go and how they're positioned, um, wherever they need to be, um, I will ensure that those t tankers are there. Um, it's obvious that I will have to work with you. And if you invite me to Alaska, I will certainly be there to see for myself. You're invited to Alaska. Thank you. There you go. Uh, so are you, uh, General Brunson. Um, I'm just going to be one one final quick question for you, General Brunson. What what's your assessment of this new China, North Korean Russian 
strategic partnership. The intel I'm reading is it's more than just kind of a facade. It's quite concerning. Do you have any thoughts on that, General? Yes, Senator. Um, I, I think that um, one of the things that we have to continue to look at, we have to continue to try to understand what's coming back. The things that are going out, known, seen, yeah. open press and the like. Um, I, I think as well that uh, as we continue to see DPRK reach to other locations, I think we also have to be cognizant of the, the, the opportunities that we have because there might be a fissure between China and DPRK now that they're looking toward Russia. Uh, I think that uh, the, the quid pro quo relationship amongst the, the authoritarian colluders, I think that's going to be there. And I think that's the assailable flank that we have to deal with things early and often. Uh, I think that there are things in the IC that we can apply to these relationships that we might understand better. Uh, and I don't mean this in any martial sense, but there are nodes that could be targetable outside of DPRK and other locations that would help us to understand the illicit trade that's going on amongst these nations. Sir. Good. Great. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to supporting both of you gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, Senator Scott, you have no further questions. Uh, well, I must confess that throughout the morning, I've had the strange feeling being addressed as General Reed, I was promoted, uh, but I realized that's not the case. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, both, uh, I wasn't addressed, you were, sir. Both of you have done an outstanding job. You have the uh, experience, the background, and the values, which are essential to your roles, and I look forward to a speedy confirmation. With that, I would adjourn the hearing. Thank you.